Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in. As you can see, the setup is a bit different from the last couple of videos, in case you've seen them. I've uh, ditched the headphones because now I have my microphone. Um, please don't laugh at me, I've been told that I'm supposed to have it a little bit slanted, so I know it looks a little bit odd that I'm talking to you here and then, you know, this thing is kind of just sitting there. I'll experiment with different ways to put it. I think it captures the audio quite well now, um, which the... Um, inbuilt microphone of the computer definitely does not have a new MacBook Pro uh, 13 inch and the mic is very bad here so I think it's much better with the with the mic it's just there you know I can look at it as if it I was talking to someone I won't but you know I, I hope um, I hope you'll be able to live with that in any case I'll get straight to the point um, I put up a blog post on the site um, yesterday evening I think or maybe Sunday I can't quite remember um, and um, it's it's market related. It's about financial markets. I, the title is Remember the Rules, and um, it kind of is a recap of the regime we're in, which I think we have to do once in a while uh, when we observe markets. Even though it's kind of like feels that we're rehashing old arguments, sometimes it's nice to just recap what the regime looks like, especially at the moment, because I think. The regime we're in at the moment is sort of a very distinct one that some investors, especially old school investors, might have some some trouble identifying with or or navigating. So you know, I think that's it's quite important. So I'll talk a little bit about that, and then uh, towards the end, I'll have some recommendations for you. So let's get started. So th the first thing I wanted to talk about in that um, with that small piece is um, the the notion of a, a V-shaped recovery. Because, because basically what's happening at the moment is that the narrative about markets is kind of treading water, uh, which is understandable because you had the big collapse in March as the reality of the COVID-19 crisis became apparent. You had the extremely aggressive policy response, which is still ongoing. Markets, in this case equities, you know, promptly rallied, you know, 40 to 50 percent, depending on, on which index you look at. And now they're kind of moving sideways. They're still moving up. As I said in my previous video, I think, you know, I think the direction is still up, but they're kind of, it's becoming a little bit more choppy. And, um, and I don't think that's a particular surprise. What is a bit odd, though, is that one of the economic discussions that's tied to this idea of choppy price action is the notion that the recovery in the economy is not going to be v-shaped or there's a lot of debate about whether it's going to be v-shaped or not and you know i know that for some people listening to this this will be sort of very very simple stuff but just to make it clear right that there's a huge difference between a v-shape recovery in in an indicator which is measured in year over year growth or even month to month or quarter on quarter and even some of the surveys compared to a V-shaped recovery, just to say a full recovery in the level of output, in the level of consumer spending, in the level of income uh, manufacturing output, these kind of things, right? And it seems like people are con con confusing the two at the moment, which is really, no, they really shouldn't. Um, and there are a couple of reasons why they shouldn't do that. First of all, like I just said, they're not the same thing. I mean, we're certainly going, we're almost certainly going to get a V-shaped recovery in growth. I mean, almost by mathematical definition, but we're almost certainly not going to get a V-shaped recovery in the level of output and the level of GDP, if you wanted to have sort of the big picture, but you know, you could pick any sub indicator as well. And even realizing that, however, that's not necessarily uh, enough to um, to conclude that markets to some extent is going to be surprised by it or take it take it in a bad way. I mean, think about it like this. I mean, after two thousand eight, it took uh, the crisis in two thousand eight. It took U.S. GDP, you know, three years almost to make a full recovery. But markets by then were all had all, had almost doubled from the low, right? The, the S and P 500 equity index. So markets don't wait, a, wait around for. Um, um, let me put like, let me. I want to make sure I put this as precisely as I can. Markets don't wait around for output to, you know, to make a full recovery before they start pricing in that recovery. I mean, this is just this is common knowledge, and I think that. What we're seeing at the moment is that markets are trading on the margin of the recovery, which is that the the economic data are improving, and of course, which relates to the 
the regime we're in, they're trading on the very, very, very aggressive policy um, regime that we have or policy stimulus regime we have. And one way to to frame the debate in the context of what I've just been talking about is this idea that, you know, you could perhaps argue that it's unreasonable for the equity markets to hit a new high, as I believe they are at the moment, at least Nasdaq is. Um, the S&P 500 is still some way off, um, but, you know, they're getting there. I mean, it's maybe unreasonable for markets to go to a new high, even as output measured by GDP is so far away from pre-crisis high. But the difference between the two is, you know, valuation and to some extent the, the, the multiple that we pay for for uh, for equities in this case. And that multiple is driven by policy, right? And the policy regime at the moment is is it's distinct in the sense that it's characterized by I would say two things. And I think when I when I when I call the piece or when I ask the question in the piece sort of uh, a little bit provocatively and you know, I ask you to remember the rules, you know, these are the rules we're supposed to remember, right? Because if you go back to Q4 2018, we had an inkling that maybe we were on track for some kind of global monetary policy normalization, which is to say the Fed was raising rates and they were telling us, you know, that the, the, they were kind of this on autopilot and they would get to a neutral and slightly um, and slightly contract contractory neutral rate of three three and a half percent, and they were just getting there, and they were kind of like they were they were just trucking along. Even in other central banks, in in the case of my day job, you know, markets were pricing in that the ECB would um, would maybe start raising interest rates, or at least Draghi might be able to get away and end his tenure, you know, with a token interest rate. Right? Q4, Q4 2018 tr changed that dramatically. You had a huge market drawdown. And since then, central banks have doubled down on, on this Hippocratic Oath strategy in which, you know, do no harm, which then feeds over into a, a perception that they are very, very scared of making a mistake to the downside, right? So you get, you end up with two, um, you end up with two ways that this is reflected in market and market expectations. One is, well, policymakers are now more likely to err on the side of providing more stimulus rather than less, which is different compared to, you know, a traditional central bank reaction function in which, you know, you have a central bank and as unemployment starts to go down and as inflation perhaps starts to pick up or wages start to pick up a little bit, they start, you know, pulling away, pu pulling away the punch ball as it were. Or at least this is the way a lot of these sort of very, very traditional old school models are, are set up. But those models have been dead for such a long time now that, you know, I don't, we can safely say that we shouldn't really discount. We can discount, we can, we can discount, discount them at zero. That's my point. So you end up with, with a situation in which central banks are more, are, 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 are going to, they're going to provide more stimulus rather than less, and they're going to do it more often rather than not. And by the way, this is even before COVID-19, right? Which, um, let me just get this away, which, um, which I think is, which I think is an even, even greater point to the, uh, to where we are now, because, you know, after, after COVID-19, you know, there's, how, how much are we printing, right? 20, 25% of global GDP. And if that doesn't work to say, if we still have, um, parts of the economy that's struggling a little bit, well, we'll do more, right? And I think, that the transition into that regime, even though it's a regime that in, investors ought to know quite well by now, it's still something that, you know, sometimes investors struggle with a little bit. Now, a very, very interesting aspect of this regime, which became clear last week, I think, and I mentioned this in, in the blog post, is I got the non-farm payroll um, report last week for June which posted, I mean, I, which is a little bit over 2 million um, new jobs, or, or maybe that was the May. But anyway, it's a strong, it was a strong headline. I can't remember. It's a strong headline for the second month on the spin. And immediately, um, you know, some market uh, participants and observers were like, well, hang on a minute. Maybe this is, this is bad news, right? Because it might lead uh, Congress, in this case, the U.S. Congress, to become complacent about the next f fiscal stimulus package. And then, you know, as I quote in the article, immediately you got some, some sources from the White House, 
I think it was a Washington Post journalist, Jeff Stein, quoting some of his sources at the White House saying, oh, yeah, well, you know, we have a, the fact that we are now having a stronger labor market than we might have expected means that, yeah, maybe we don't have to extend the $600 unemployment insurance extension, for example, or maybe we can do a little bit less, right? And, um, and, and another, another fascinating perspective on this, which is directly related to, to the virus, was... Um, Stephen Waltman from Interfluidity, by the way, that's, he, he's fantastic. I mean, this is one of the best blogs on the internet. But anyway, he, he said, you know, uh, something like to the, to the effect I had that he has mixed effects about strong job creation now, because really what ought to be happening now is that people should be out of job and government should be paying them to stay out of job, to stay out of a job so as to control the virus. In other words, you know, if you put it a little bit, um, if you just, you know, if you paraphrase, which I think is ironic, but you can paraphrase like this, you know, we're supposed to be a little bit dissatisfied and afraid of the fact that the US economy is now creating, creating jobs because it might lead central banks in this case and Congress to pull back on the same stimulus that is supposed to get the economy going by creating jobs in the first place. Now, again, you can play mind games like this all day long, the fact of the matter is that um, this particular position can't be sustained for indefinitely, right? I mean, at some point, job job growth is good because the economy is doing better, or it's bad because it leads to a withdrawal of the stimulus that's kind of been propping up markets, right? And 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 you know how exactly we square that circle? Who knows? But I'm just saying that we have a very particular environment at the moment. But eventually, you know, this is going to this is going to become a story, right? And I think. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have a, more to say about this particular uh, topic at a later point. I mean, I, I wrote, um, I recently did a, an essay about this, you know, ubiquitous theory at the moment. Everybody's talking about MMT, what that means. But I do think that there is a, that there is a, a, a sliver of wokeness in, 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 in the economic debate at the moment, which is to say, you know, there's this idea that, you know, fiscal policy and monetary policy they can just you know just print money and if, if if one person is unemployed that's one person too many and we, then we just have to we have to print enough money so that everyone has a job everyone is happy everyone can get exactly what they want and if there's a company that's about to go bankrupt you know we have to save them and by the way suggesting otherwise either because you might have i mean you could even call it like a moral view to the the contrary or you might just argue that you know if you do all that might you might have negative side effects as well even suggesting that you know then you're just cruel you're evil right you know you're just uh, you know one of these austrian economic cretins that don't know that you know that, that don't know who they're talking about what they're talking about and i'm like well maybe but you know at some point you know we have to wake up and smell the coffee about this and and and, and realize that Printing, pushing a button, printing money, that's easy. Oh my God, that's easy. We can do that. We can do that all day long. And, you know, probably because there's no inflation that's going to, you know, really constrain us in that. But, you know, the alternative story really is that it's easy enough to print money, but it's really difficult to make sure the money goes to the right people. And making sure the money goes to the right people is also a political debate, right? So it becomes a political story about who does the people with the printing press believe should have the money. Now, there's a hint here. Normally, at least in the way we normally understand these things, the, the persons, the people, the institution with the printing press is an independent institution, it's the central bank. Don't really decide whether company A, B, or whether you're black, white, you know, which is very controversial at the moment, who, who should get the money? Well, this is, this is again the thing, you know, there's an encroaching, there's a fiscal encroaching of monetary policymakers or the other way around, you can see monetary policymakers are being kind of forced, dragged, or maybe are inviting in upon themselves to do sort of quasi-fiscal policy. And I just feel like when we have debates about this, we're not really being honest about what this means. And and like I said, well, I mean, this is this is debate for another for another video, uh, another essay. But I just wanted to put it out there, sort of as a as a perspective on this, because. I realized that for investors, maybe the easiest thing to think about this is not whether the regime is right or, or wrong, you know, it just is. And if you have that view as an investor, I also think that you get very easily to a, 
to a point where you are able to spot a potential change, right? Because obviously a shift in this narrative and this regime would be quite significant for investors, asset prices, all the stuff that, you know, financial market participants care about. And I think we know what to look for, right? Um, we have to look for a um, a split in the money printing narrative, which goes a which which for example could be along the lines of those in favor of redistribution of wealth splits from from the sort of the true money printers who just say, look, I mean, we don't have to raise taxes. I mean, why would we raise taxes? We just print the money and give everyone what they want, you know. And 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 that argument, by the way, is aligned with the, with the argument that goes, you know what, if if all this money printing, you know, puts a, a few a few more zeros on Elon Musk's and Je Jeff Bezos's bank account, that's okay. I mean, we, we, that's fine, you know. And they'll probably they're philanthropic, they're philanthropic anyway. They'll spend it they'll spend it well. Whereas, whereas there is another group. Um, there's another group on that side of the fence, I think at least, who's very, very vocal against that particular point. They are in favor of redistribution. And that's not quite clear yet. They haven't quite been honest with us yet, I think, in terms of what they want. But I think that is coming at some point. It's going to be a split there in sort of the what I call the, the MMT or Team MMT uh, consensus. Um, you could again talk about capital mobility, um, you know, which is which is to say, you know, MMT becomes difficult in in smaller countries, in particular, or money printing when you have free capital mobility. So there's another element here which which could be challenged again. Although that's a little bit, I mean, again, I'll need to hash that out in more details later. But you know, that's another aspect. Much more simply, you could simply you could look at a central banker and say, look, I mean, if Christine Lagarde or Jerome Powell or uh, or Koda in, uh, in in Japan, the bank trans suddenly comes out talking about the risk of asset price bubbles, moral hazard. Then we know there's a big shift, right? But they're not talking about that. In fact, um, in the U.S., you know, when when Jerome Powell sits in front of um, uh, policy makers in in the um, in the press conferences and journalists after the Fed meetings, you know, they've asked him about this, and he said, "Nah, you know, we're not worried about asset prices. It's not this. It's not our job to worry about that. It's our job to keep, get the economy going. So therefore, we're going to keep printing." I mean, how 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 clear do you want it to get? So, I want to finish. Uh, I want to finish this uh, story by saying, look, I mean, we have a regime. You know what to look for in terms of when that regime might break down. I would say trying to bet on that now is 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 very it's very radical. You, there's not a good reason at the moment, I think, to bet against a continuation of that of that regime. So I think you know, like I and like I end my blog post with, you know, maybe it's just important to remember the rules such as they are at the moment and act accordingly. And um, especially because it's so easy for us to gauge what would have to change for that regime to um, to be different or to change. Um, so I'll leave it at that with uh, with this story, and then I'll I'll, um, I'll 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 move over to my recommendations, which are kind of related. Um, there is um, there's a piece in um, on Aon.com, which is this collection of. Um, uh, this is a free site, and they publish uh, essays and articles. Um, and you, they, they, it's usually quite good. They have all kinds of stuff: uh, politics, uh, science, economics. And the particular piece I'm talking about now, and uh, let me just see. I just want to pick it up here. It's called the um, Ungoverned Globe, and it's written by a um, a graduate teaching assistant in politics and international studies at the University of Cambridge. Um, and his name is Benjamin Studebaker. Um, by the way, I will po post links to the blog post I just discussed in this article and everything else I'm talking about in, in the description of the video. But um, anyway, Benjamin takes a fairly trivial argument and story and turns it into something very interesting. I think. What he does, I think... He starts with the idea that everyone hates globalization, or this idea that globalization, you know, the liberal world order, as he talks about, is under attack. I mean, 
trivial. I think a lot. This story has been written, you know, a thousand times in a thousand essays in different ways. Right? But I think what's really interesting in terms of what Benjamin does is he says what the liberal world order does, and I think he frames this well. Well, he says he says that it makes it, it basically feeds off and lives off the free movement of capital and the free movement of labor. Right. So already there we have a dichotomy because we know that the free movement of capital and the free movement of labor has a lot of positive effects. Right? We get richer, but it also has downside effects. And the downside effects are the, are the things that political movements are now trying to exploit in nation states. And up until this point, I think this is not controversial, but what I think Benjamin does very well is that he then goes on to say, look, the current crop of politicians, you know, the, we can call them populist, Trump, you have the kind of populists in, uh, you have different kinds of populism in, in Europe that kind of opposes the EU and, and you, know, you know, lifts up the nation, the nation state as sort of the unit of political movement. You have Brexit, of course, in the UK, which was sort of direct reply and response in, in terms of rejecting um, the, the at least at least economic integration and political integration in within Europe um, and he makes this argument they're all phonies right they're all phonies because at the end of the day they rely more on the sustained existence of the liberal world order rather compared to their sort of willingness to tear it down and I think for me, this is basically Trump in a nutshell, right? Trump says all the scary things when it comes to globalization, right? He's waging a trade war with China. He's, he's threatening to dismantle uh, NAFTA. He's threatening to leave NATO, the WHO, where they've, they've stopped NATO. So he has this, there is this element of the Trump presidency, which is certainly very much attuned to the idea that the U.S., the, the sort of the, the benevolent role of the U.S. in liberal work, global order is gone, and now the U.S. is going to be very cynically self-interested, and you know, um, and by the way, all this interdependence between you know, like-minded nations is, is baloney, right? But then, we have learned now on the five, on the four years uh, with Trump to call his bluff, right? I mean, sure, he'll wage, a, he'll wage a. a, a um, a trade war with China, just up until the point at which the stock market starts to sell off, he's like, well, you know, oh, maybe he's not gonna, uh, maybe, maybe not so much. Uh, or, or like today, he tweeted, um, I think, you know, he did this in, in all caps, you know, Nasdaq at new highs. Well, there you go. If you want the Nasdaq to go up, there's a good chance that that's gonna limit your ability to really, f you know, have a go at China in terms of a trade war. Not to mention a hot war, which would be, you know, a completely different, completely different prospect from uh, from the perspective of stock markets and and. And I think you see the same in Europe, right? I mean, um, do, do you, does Italy, for example, let's take the populist movement, Italy, do they really want to leave the Eurozone? Eh. As, a, as a, in my day job, as a chief Eurozone economist, let me just tell you, I'll call their bluff all day long. Brexit is the same. I mean, yeah, so now they've left, but they still want a good deal, right? They still, and, and they're still very unhappy with the fact that the Europe might not give them a good deal. So there's like, they kind of like want, globalization but on their terms and I can kind of understand that right I've always said when it comes to someone like Trump I'm like sure I mean the US has the biggest cojones in in the world and if they want to sort of like try to claw back some of the power that they feel they've lost uh, in sort of all this interdependence that's fine but just say it as it is then don't tell don't tell me that you know the rest of the world is cheating you or something but I think I think Benjamin uh, really hits that uh, hits that note quite well with his piece. I'll, I'll write. I'll, I'll, you should uh, um, you should um, you should go read. I'll just read a few things from it, um, um, which kind of which summarizes some of the points I've just made. Um, so, for example, he says. Um, instead of directly challenging the liberal order, national governments point the finger at the order while largely continuing to align with it economically. Trump is very good at this bait and switch. I, I completely agree. I think that's a very good way to, to, to frame the way that uh, a, a Trump presidency is kind of forced in and out of these positions where, you know, one day he's like, 
Um, another great example is the U.S. Um, involvement in the Middle East. You know, one day he's like, "Why are we in the Middle East? Europe? You know, we don't have, we don't need troops there. I mean, and then you know, somebody does something in the Middle East and like, send in the boats. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, fl we're gonna lop some cruise missiles out. And we're like, well, what is it? What's it? What's it going to be then? And and you know, which is sort of obviously the sort of traditional knee-jerk reaction from from Americans in terms of you know, it's their backyard. They want to make sure that everybody knows that they can kind of do what they want there. And and um, and he, he goes on. I mean, uh, Benjamin goes on to say on Trump that he says Trump gets away with continuing to support the liberal order by opposing it in public while continuing to maintain the economic relationship that are its foundation. Again, I completely agree. At the end of the day. Um, I would call someone like Trump's bluff any day of the week in terms of making really radical changes um, that have actual domestic costs as well. So, for example, a really tough, hard trade war with China and actually cutting ties with China, that would have economic costs for the U.S., right? Would he be willing to bear them? Would he be willing to look, watch the stock market go down as a result? Trump? No way. He wouldn't be willing to bear it. There's another thing I wanted to. Um, there's another thing I wanted to say about this. Yes, because then you know, this is the point. Then you know, he, he goes, he, he takes this step further, which is one of the things that I've thought about a lot. In the sense that, when when I've been speaking to people about Trump, I'm like, well, I'm not so worried about Trump. I'm worried about what comes after him, right? I'm worried about like a real Trump, some one one who's willing to go. I don't care about the stock market. I don't care about short term job losses in Silicon Valley or whatever. No, 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 no. That's fine. If there are costs there, I'm willing to bear them in order to achieve my objectives over here. Then, you know, that would be a big shift. And Benjamin, he says that um, if Trump was more than a performer, if he really believed the nationalist narrative he sells, all, the, all this would suddenly become deadly serious. The risk is that by performing defiance today, Trump clears the way for a U.S. administration that's genuinely defined five or ten years down the, down the line. I couldn't agree more. And in some sense, that's also why the Trump versus Biden is just, it's an anachronism. It doesn't reflect anything, I think, other than the dysfunctional um, relationship within the two parties in the United States, which obviously, again, 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 I'm a European. It's just my view, but, um, you know, that's kind of like how I look at it, but um, but I'll uh, I'll uh, I might have something else to say about that later. Um, but you know, go read Benjamin's article; it's a really good piece. Um, finally, I just have a couple of uh, of sort of sort of quick fire recommendations. Um, Hugh Hen Hugh Hendry is back. I don't know whether you know Hugh Hendry, but he's kind of like um, a very sort of flamboyant, colorful macro manager who uh, macro fund manager. He closed his fund in 2017, and now he's sort of starting to do videos and. And some writing some pieces from his um, from his abode in Saint Bart, and you know he does these videos where he sits, you know, almost without a top and sunglasses, and talks about the world ending um, in his lounge in Saint Bart. I mean, um, I've, I'm posting two uh, recent appearances from him: one uh, with uh, Jonathan Farrow uh, from Bloomberg TV, and one with um, o o uh, Somerset Webb. God damn it! I'm sorry about this. Let me just get the. Let me just get this right. Um, her name is the Money Week podcast, and um, it's Marin Somerset Webb. Yes, that's her name, and uh, it's a 30-minute um, discussion with Hugh Hendry, and he basically goes through the same things as he does in the seven-minute video with Jonathan Ferrer. So you can pick the one you want. Um, I think his uh, the, ju the the gist of his position is he thinks that Joe Rogan should be uh, the president of the Fed, and that only then would the Fed commit to being truly irresponsible in a way which would generate the inflation that he doesn't believe we're going to get with the current regime. Well, I'll let them. Um, I'll let Mr. Henry's um, position uh, talk for himself, but you know I thought it was quite fun that he's back, and uh, I'm looking forward to his next rant. And uh, you know you should go check it out. Finally, um, or two more things. You know, last video I um, recommended the BIP podcast, which is these three Australian dudes talking about economics. The latest one they did 
uh, was about equities and stocks. And I thought that was quite interesting, um, and uh, you should go check it out. And very finally, um, I should probably have more to say about this at some point, but it's so dense that I can't really do it justice here. Brad and Eric Weinstein, they had sort of a part two conversation, three hours this time on, I think it was a Brett Weinstein's Dark Horse podcast. They're sitting in his garden, I think, you know, having having a drink, talking about physics. I mean, yeah, I, mean, I love that type of stuff. You might not love it, but, you know, if you're into that type of stuff, you should go have a listen to it. It's, it's quite fun, actually. Um, and uh, they, they get around some of the some more topical uh, issues that I discussed in some of the previous videos. And, uh, you know, I think it'll be well worth your while. Anyway, that's me at half an hour now. I think that's enough. Um, I am going to finish just by saying, you know, thank you for um, tuning in. All the links to all the stuff that I've been talking about in this video will be um, in the description on my YouTube channel. Uh, you can just subscribe on my YouTube channel. You can subscribe on my blog, which will then give you links to the blog post, which will also continue to video. So there's a couple of ways you can do this, depending on what kind of content you like. Also, if you think you need to contact me, come find me on Twitter or uh, send me an email or, um, you know, contact me through my blog. There's a couple of ways you can do it. And um, at this point, there's all there's left to say is thank you for tuning in. Thanks for uh, watching. And if you have any comments, um, suggestions, um, you know, let me know. Thank you very much.